Well, I retired from the Air Force, and um, on that day I swore I would never wear another uniform for the rest of my life. And here I am in a much hotter uniform, carrying much heavier weapons. <laughs> so it, I don't know if it, it affected my life, but it, uh, it's a comfortable environment I'm, I'm used to. Have you ever met someone born in the wrong century? Perhaps someone who likes to wear dark wool on hot days, or who has a strange affinity for black powder and firearms? Well, so have we. We'll introduce you to them and try to find out what makes them tick in this episode of Wyoming Folks. Well, for one thing, we're not crazy. We aren't a militia. Most of us that are in this hobby are professionals. We're either uh, veterans, we're either uh, doctors, lawyers. I actually work at Albertsons as a cashier. Well, you have reenactors and you have living historians. Let me clarify that first. A reenactor is somebody who reenacts an event. A living historian is somebody that portrays a person that actually existed. I actually uh, portray as uh, John Portuguese Phillips. I'm with the 5th Cavalry. How long you been with them? Six years. In the reenactments, I go by uh, Private Rip, working on, a, on the gun crew uh, there at Fort D.A. Russell in Cheyenne. My pants ripped. I had to go in and get them sewed up. So ever since then, I've been called Private Rip. Our motto for our group is, if you can prove it happened back then, and you have uh, historical research to back it up, as long as you do it in a historically correct way, you can do it. Uh, we've had people, everything from everything from uh, preachers to saloon girls, uh, wagon drivers, scouts, cooks. If you're the type of person that just wants to put on the outfit and go play, you're going to be kind of on the outside of it. There's different levels of a reenactor. You have what's called a Farby, which is somebody that just dresses the part and then they have their uh, cooler, their air mattress, you know, uh, sodas, things like that. Oh, give my highly authentic drink. Yeah, okay, secret. Yeah. And then you have the stitch counters, hardcore. Okay! At the other end of the, the spectrum, who come up and count the stitches. You know, such and such contract, government contract, only had so many stitches, and you have this, this is wrong, blah, 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 you know. Most, most reenactors are somewhere in the middle, okay. We, we do the very best doing historical research and everything else, but at the same time, if someone, especially a new person who's out there for the first or second time, we're not going to come up to them and start tearing them apart, because that defeats the purpose. You know, they're not going to want to come back. And I'm kind of lucky because soldiers did not know how to count back then. Or This is Patrick, the newest recruit to the outfit. We asked this newbie what he's learned about reenacting. Um, just to stay in character. Yeah, how do you do that? Just to do your best and listen to your commanders if you're the rank of private. You're, thir you're 13, right? 14. 14. Do, do, is there any crossover between this and being a Boy Scout? being able to tie knots. And I have to spend being private from eight to ten years. Uh, put it this way, are you ready to train others? I might. I don't think so. <laughs> the most common thing I ever hear is people see all the tents and they say, you don't sleep out here, do you? And of course we do, we sleep in the tents. And there are what we call hardcore groups that they go out in the wintertime and sleep in the tents. You know, we're not to that point, but um, if you like any type of camping, it doesn't get any better than this. Oh, whoa. <laughs> you can tell it's a little windy out here. All ground filming is eating this candy. Most of the people that do this activity are very earnest. They're very sincere. They want to portray historically correct okay um, but there are a small number of people who have their own 
goals, their own. So anytime I run into them, I try to think of how the person I portray would have reacted. The officer that I portray at some events, uh, Captain Thomas Braden Burroughs, was actually posted here. He, he came from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which isn't too far from where I come from, Western New York State. We write, I found his signatures, I found his, um, his post reports. We write the same. The health issues he faced, he, he suffered from bad bronchitis, acute bronchitis for his entire life. I have a lung condition called sarcoidosis, um, so I can, I can definitely relate to how he would have felt at certain times. I found a, a, an original picture, two actual pictures of him. We have the same hairstyle, we parted the same way. If I believed in reincarnation, I would be a little bit worried, you know, by now. some music and play with the gas. Uh, I don't know how to play. Uh, if you know your history enough, you can do some verbal dueling that could be a lot of fun. Because oh, your head's so big. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> Look for the little yellow stripe here, would you? Well, how can There's we a bigger one up your back, though. You know? <laughs> no, no. Oh. <laughs> That was nasty. Um, sometimes when the different groups get to one event, there's at least there's some interesting times. Uh, My elixir kept him alive two days longer than he normally would have lived. No, I'm saying he probably would have lived a week longer what not for the elixir. Well, what did he give me in trade? In trade for what? Uh, for uh, the life of the sergeant. Tell you what I'll do. And sometimes it gets kind of funny because if you're in a first person, and you are portraying 1860s, 1870s, well, there was no such thing as a bathroom or a restroom. And it never fails, you know, that at events, somebody will come up to you, a visitor, and say, where is the bathroom? And you want to tell them, you really do. But you have to stay in first person, so you ask, what's a bathroom? Or else you can play along with them, like, well, if you're at a developed site, well, down at the saloon, down on the corner, they have a bath house. Is that what you want? See this sign up here? It says advice, 25 cents. I'll give you some advice for free. It won't even charge you for it. Uh, but we never let it go too far. And of course, if there's an emergency, first person stops. You know, the, the safety of the person is paramount, so. Uh, I didn't stay in the service all those years to join a group and receive more orders and people yelling at you and everything else. Um, of course, when the spectators are around, you're supposed to help them step back in time. And we all understand that, yes, you're, there's going to be some yelling, but we're going to have fun doing it. And um, unfortunately, as of with any other activity, some people may take that um, to heart, or else um, they may take their rank, you know, it'll go to their head or something of that uh, nature. Fortunately, there's a very small number of people like that. There's a lot of people that think uh, we're a militia. There's um, the anti-gun lobby wants to have all of our weapons, um, the serial numbers and everything, recorded. And if you think about it, we, we use one-shot weapons that usually take a long time to load. So the scenario of us getting into a shootout with a high-tech, say, police SWAT team is just, that's crazy. You know, if anything, if... Um, we had a reenactment going on and say a terrorist attack happened, we would probably try to help our people, you know, the military, the police, ask if there's anything we can do. Yeah. Oh. 
Back then, the women had an entire language using their fan, the little hand fans they used. Uh, one, one motion with it meant that they were available. One motion meant that they were married. Uh, one motion meant, I want you to come over here. Another one would have said, get out of here. You know, and if you know that, and you know the, per like my wife and I do this all the time, and you know what's going on, or you're sitting on the side and you see something going on. It, it can be quite entertaining sometimes. Roy and his companions decide it's time for a break. There's going to be about 10 of us. 10? Okay. You want smoking or not? Right here. Now, what does this have to do with living history? <laughs> didn't, you t didn't anybody <laughs> tell you we're the new Wyoming National Guard? Oh, no. The budget cuts are really interesting. Well, you guys all look nice. Dad, you're on TV. Make himself come. Here you go, an action shoot, shot. Shoot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John was a sweetheart and brought us a cheeseburger. I scarfed mine. I, I didn't even put the ketchup mushroom on. I just scarfed the meat. Had a few of the fries. I'm glad you enjoy it. Mm. Every reenactor and living historian looks for that moment. There is a certain moment. It's It happens in sports. It happens in... There's a certain moment in time where everything just comes together and it's perfect. The moment I had was at a place called Fort Hartsiff, Nebraska. And the fort, the only electricity on the fort is in their uh, carpenter shop. Everything else, the officers' uh, houses, the hospital, the barracks, the kitchen, everything is candle lantern. I was sitting there at, on the front porch of the barracks with the lanterns lit and everything. It was at night. The fort is completely surrounded by cornfields. There's no lights from a city anywhere nearby, and the coyotes were howling. That was my moment. <laughs> you could just picture yourself back in time, and you could realize what somebody back in the 1800s may have felt like. And uh, each, you could ask 10 different people in this activity, and they'll give you 10 different scenarios or answers, or, but it's usually something that, it, don't, it happens not very frequently. And it's just one of those things that you remember. The feel at Fort Phil is a little different, as it seems everyone is kind of on guard. We just found that uh, yep, horses are running. Uh-oh. The trooper camp and the nearby Native American camp have agreed to an armed mock battle the next day. Are you nervous about it at all? Nah, no. not at all. That's cool. I enjoy it very much. I'm nervous about working with the Indians because I've worked with them before. And uh, they're very good at what they do. Uh, they ride bareback, they hang under their horses to shoot at you, and it's, it's pretty impressive. It's, they're very quick. <laughs> We check in with our favorite armed juvenile. Yeah, and I had to travel five hours just to get here. Roy fills us in on the finer points of mock combat. 
You don't want to John Wayne it. You don't want to do something that you know you'd get killed for. You know, uh, you just want to do it as as correctly as you can. Uh, sometimes, if you're in a big organized unit, they'll come by and say, "Okay, you take a hit here. You take a hit here." Um, so this way, if one Confederate fires, 30 guys don't go down. Okay, that wouldn't look good. When there's one Indian pointing a rifle at you, and uh, the shot from the muzzle, that's a pretty good indication that it's time to go. Uh, of course, we don't aim directly at people. We usually aim above them or off to the side of them. Um, and older people like me, if it's really hot out and you're getting exhausted, you just fall over like you were shot. <laughs> I'll be ready. What you do is you measure a certain amount of powder out. Each different weapon used a different amount of powder greens. And then once you get the, the powder measure topped up, you close the, the nozzle, tip it upside down into the round. And then what we use is styrofoam. Uh, they used paper wattage back then, or wax sometimes. But uh, styrofoam we found, when we fire blanks, uh, the charge disintegrates the styrofoam. So it's a very safe load. It doesn't have anything coming out from the end of the, the weapon. And then we just pack it down, and that's all there is to it. And then um, before the actual battle scenarios, uh, one of the people that helped organize the event, they do a weapons check. And they make sure nobody has any lab ammunition. Uh, everybody has only blanks. They check the weapons, make sure that uh, there's no riflings in the barrel or, you know, like little leftover pieces of, of lead, like if you did go shoot your live rounds through your rifle at some time. It's, it's very safety conscious. Um, in the heat of a battle one time when they had hooping and hollering all around me and shrieks and guns going off and the, the smell of powder and everything else you could you could literally feel what it was like for the soldiers back then of course there wasn't that last element of fear that oh crap I'm gonna get killed um, but you, you could imagine what they went through on both sides <laughs> <laughs>